Well, it's an honor to be here. Um, I wanted to uh, take folks through an, an arc of how Ron's contributions have influenced artificial intelligence research uh, through influences broadly on the community of researchers as well as on individuals like myself. In one of Ron's early, earliest writings about DA, we actually quoted decision analysis as a jargon term, I think, of some kind, the new idea. That's a formal procedure for the analysis of decision problems, a procedure I call decision analysis. It talked about it being an effective, systematic reasoning about human action for transforming opaque decision problems into a transparent, into a transparent set of problems by a sequence of transparent steps. Um, I came to Stanford interested in the mind, in artificial intelligence, and encountered Ron a couple of years into, the, into my pursuit of the study of computational mechanisms underlying thought and intelligent behavior. The founders of the AI field said in their document in 1955 that they were trying to find how to make machines solve the kinds of problems now reserved for humans. And you might think that what Ron was saying and doing is, was disparate, but in many ways the clarity of thinking about thought and action in the world, the distinctions that have come to the fore with decision analysis, so critical in the evolution of artificial intelligence over the last 20 years into what I would call modern AI, which is founded on some of the principles that come out of the management science and engineering community, the, the EES community, and so on. And I thought I'd just go through a few of the contributions and their impact uh, with the group today, kind of an arc through time. First, just sequential decision making. Any kind of agent in the world must take actions over time under uncertainty. And in Ron's early work, his doctoral thesis work um, on markup decision processes, he really proposed and explored this idea of an agent in the world heading through life uh, under uncertainty, garnering reward with it, at, at every epoch. Um, and this work and his work on, on going from value iteration to policy iteration was quite well appreciated by many engineering disciplines, but not artificial intelligence. But in the late 1980s and early 90s, there was an explosion of interest in this representation and these methods for thinking about what does it mean to be an automatic agent in the world with values and beliefs that can make decisions over time, uh, leading to notions of planning under uncertainty that are explicitly founded on Ron's earlier work, including partially observable MDPs, POMDPs, where you're uncertain about the states of the world as you go through the world. And onto reinforcement learning, which it really is the work of MDPs now, moved into the world where you're uncertain about the probabilities and rewards as well, and you're trying to tune those parameters as you go. This is the excitement behind AlphaGo, for example. Another set of contributions that Ron made was the clear focus and scholarship around information value. We all about value information here. Uh, excuse me. One of Ron's papers here which really laid out things so beautifully that it was read widely, at least by students in my era, trying to figure things out about artificial intelligence. But the idea of value information be became the foundations in AI of what we call selective perception. Here's a robot in the world going through the world. What does it look at? What does it collect? What's the cost benefit of looking with one or more sensors about the world? For example, work about in, in an office system, recognizing what's going on. We couldn't afford to look at everything. We used value information to automate what systems look at over time. And we took this to uh, an early work that I was, I was doing to NASA Mission Control Center here and said, wow, these people are under lots of time pressure as the space shuttle launches. What do we do to control the complexity of displays? And it turned out that the answer in this, in, and you'll hear more about influence, influence diagrams in a second here, was making decisions about what to show human beings by understanding the, re the, the, the expected value of revealed information in a time critical setting. Now, this idea of information became very important in many areas. In Microsoft Research, for example, uh, a lot of what we've done over the years leverages this idea. We can't look at everything. We want to basically, for example, in a traffic system here, we want to make sure we balance the information we're getting with privacy to understand selectively what's the best part of the traffic system to look at given some notion of a demand-weighted interest in collapsing the uncertainty in a whole traffic system. Another uh, deep area of scholarship 
that Ron uh, brought to the world. Uh, this, in this case, working with Jim Matheson, his mother's at SRI, was representation. How do you represent knowledge of key aspects of a decision problem in a compact way that can be easily used to communicate among people? This is the influence diagram, this is the comment in the influence diagram paper, provides new clarity to the conversation between decision maker and analyst, allowing representations that are both easily understood and mathematically consistent. Now, at the time of influence diagrams coming to the fore, there was kind of a debate in the artificial intelligence community about, in fact, even, even uh, folks from the logic-based or heuristic-based theory-proving world as, we, as they face interest, interested graduate students like myself in, in probability theory and decision-making and uncertainty, were digging in and saying, this is physics envy. This is numerical methods. This is operations research. These, these, these numbers can't possibly re be related to the rich symbolic reasoning we're seeking. And what we had here was a beautiful notion of key variables, independencies, dependencies, preferences, values, and uncertainties captured in a way at multiple levels, down to numerical and down to infer inferential procedures to operate on those graphs. So that decision had, had broad implications for um, on, on folks like Uta Pearl and others who started thinking about inference under uncertainty with Bayesian networks, as they were called, up to influence diagrams and onto the earlier book I showed you on generalizations of MDPs. We talk a little bit about the, some broad influences beyond the specifics of value information, representation, and influence diagrams. This whole notion of, of MDPs, of an agent going to the world, making, making decisions, living its life, trying to optimize something that's well-defined in this case, to what I would say are broad influences that came from the perspective, um, the, the distinctions, and the clarity of thought that Ron exuded and, 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 and framed with the whole area called decision analysis now and its methods. So at Stanford, I was taking classes and reading books like this by Nils Nilsson on principles of artificial intelligence. It's a picture of my book, actually. And when I came to take decision analysis intro with Ron, I was just completely stunned that the ideas were so relevant. And my reading material changed <laughs> to sets of really interesting discussions about human consultation and decision-making under uncertainty. And it was so relevant to the understanding principles of intelligence for a human or an agent, no matter what the capabilities. Probability was not necessarily the answer, even in uncertainty workshops in the day, in the mid-1980s to through the late um, 1980s. There were big, what were called religious wars over what metric one should be using, if you people recall this. And I have to say that it was such a pleasure to, for Ron, <laughs> for me to receive, I guess I'll call it tele telegraphy, from Laplace, Jeffries, Jaynes, and again, I'll mention Myron Tribus, on this notion that, and this is Ron's quote here from an early paper, that an all-encompassing view of probability, not as an artifact, but as a basic way of reasoning about life. Very important distinction, and it really helped us write papers and communicate, going back to Cox's proof and to Myron Travis's wonderful writings, and of course back to Laplace, uh, centuries before, that we could really grow artificial intelligence on the shoulders of giants um, and, and, and move forward rather than debate something that didn't make a lot of sense. Another perspective notion is how we actually think about designing and building and executing in real time for computation AI systems. For example, in my dis dissertation work with Ron, I was looking at this idea of, well, you can't, you want to be normative. You have probabilities, preferences, but you have a, a Bayesian reasoning system that you can't solve fast enough given the crashing utility, for example, about treating a patient who's gasping for breath. What do you do? And this whole notion of thinking deeply about value of information transforms to a methodology for guiding computation, expected value computation as a model of bounded rational decision making under uncertainty that we could call normative. Here's some, some titles of papers that came out in those days, uh, work that we were doing and I was doing with colleagues. And just recently, uh, 
Sam Gershman and Josh Tenenbaum and I wrote a piece in Science. If you want to, look, it's easy to find. It's just a year ago or so, 18 months maybe. Really taking a decision analytic approach to foundations of intelligence. What's going on in our minds right now? What did evolution perhaps discover that Ron Howard has been teaching us as a rediscovery in terms of the foundations of how minds work? Also very, very important to, to my thinking and, and given my passion about applying these methods in the real world, whether they be advisory systems running on AI technologies, decision theoretic technologies, or autonomous systems or mixes, is life and death decision making. This idea that you could actually take these methods and very carefully apply them to the hardest problems and the most controversial problems uh, involving large swings of value about life uh, Ron said here in this, in this paper, no assertion can command attention in time of emergency like it's a matter of life and death. The problem of making decisions that can affect the likelihood of death is one of the most perplexing facing the analyst. And this, this high level frame here talks, really addresses issues about where to put a power plant with low probabilities of influencing uh, fatality rates, uh, decision, personal decisions about health care, the urgent matters that come to the mind a week before a, a, a critical surgery that's high stakes, high risk, for example. And I was really fascinated about what it would take to take these AI methods, which had been used as advisory tools for fairly, I thought, lightweight applications, like advising on which antibiotics potentially give somebody out of a set of feasible antibiotics, to what do you do in trauma care situation right now? How do I advise uh, a physician time critical decision making about, for example, respiratory failure versus respiratory distress. We needed notions of probability to really have a real semantic to what we're talking about here. And we needed to reason about life and death decision making as it guides actions in the world. And if an autonomous system was going to help a human being, we better get things right. And the inspiration that came from the papers that Ron wrote about getting into, the, into this world of we can reason about and be very helpful about life and decision making. And it's gonna clarify issues, for example, about principal agency, who's the decision for with the utility model. This is an example of a paper with Adam Seaver, who's a trauma care surgeon and also an ES PhD. I don't know if Adam's in the audience anywhere. Um, but the idea of taking influence diagrams, extending them to reason under uncertainty in time critical situations, and going from not just to healthcare, but back to NASA again, and thinking about people who had their finger at propulsion control at the front of the Michigan Control Center on a button that if they delayed given an error, we're trying to model the errors here with, it, with, with Bayesian networks, if there was a delay of X seconds, the shuttle can come back and land at the Kennedy Space Center. If it was something like 80 seconds, the shuttle would land at the Mojave Desert. Something like 97 or 110 seconds, the shuttle would land in Madagascar. And in between those things, the propulsion control people said, we don't know what's gonna happen. And so lots of time criticality was assessed and so on. You can imagine ha having a life and death decision making background would help with the design of that kind of system, even a display of information in real time. And just to finish up, I want to mention that at Microsoft Research now and at other centers, this idea of the ubiquity now of thinking deeply about not just what you hear about machine learning these days, predictions and pattern recognition, but taking it to the, where the rubber meets the road to action and thinking deeply about a data to predictions to decisions pipeline being so critical. And then thinking about the role of the human being and designing your system to work with humans, understanding their foibles and beliefs and background as well as what a system might do well or not do well. So as an example of a of a pipeline here we, we designed. So here's a system we built several years back in 2007 or so, which, which computes for every patient being discharged from the hospital, the probability that they'll bounce back to the hospital within 30 days. It's a penalizable metric used by Medicare services. It's a preventable readmission, one paper showed in 2009 in a, in a New England Journal article, is about $20 billion a year in US. Preventable, they believe, with good arguments. But in thinking through these numbers, what they mean, you have to think through specifics of illness and patients and preferences and think deeply about who is the decision maker, which we bring up in our lab, and whose utility function. 
to understand a decision analysis, it's not just pattern recognition, but it's understanding if I have a pattern recognition system that's giving me a probability of readmission, and I can do different things, I can take different interventions over time. Building simulation systems and sensitivity analyses that will show if I dip this pattern recognition system into this hospital with these preferences that can swing and be set in different ways, what does it mean in terms of efficacy of, a, of, a, of an intervention and the cost of the intervention in terms of returns and the optimal thing to do for t sets of patients? The same kind of thinking is behind Cortana right now, and thinking about when should it come up and remind somebody of a commitment that it's, 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 it's grabbed out of email? How many people have ever seen this before? I will send you a title and abstract. You haven't sent it yet, the system tells me. <laughs> but when to do that? And even thinking about building these bigger systems we call, we call integrative AI systems now with many components. In our lab, it's all about decision-making under uncertainty, value of information over time, uh, controlling many modules as they interact, giving you a sense for the future of artificial intelligence, being founded on decision theoretic, but the engineering practice of decision analysis. I want to just end briefly, I know I'm hitting, hitting zero here, and I said go a bit, one, minute, one minute extra, so about value, ethics, and responsibility. Um, I and many of you ha have enjoyed deep and, and uh, um, valuable discussions with Ron about ethics, responsibility to oneself and to uh, colleagues and to society overall. And if you look in the last few months, just the last few months, uh, headlines about automation of various kinds coming out of the, mostly in terms of the large scale machine learning uh, with, with, with large data sets. This is kind of headlines we've been seeing, we've been seeing and they're, they're, they're important headlines to, to note. But the community has responsibility and there's several different segments that need to get active and involved, especially as technology gets ahead of itself in terms of society's ability to reflect. Uh, and I want to mention briefly at Microsoft, um, several years ago, uh, actually got into full force two years ago, and I, I'm, I'm sure this comes in part from the framing and the decision making and, re and reflection that came from uh, being immersed in, in Ron's world. I set up, working with the senior leadership team at Microsoft, the Ether Committee. It stands for AI and Ethics and Engineering and Research. And there are seven working groups. You can just imagine these are active working groups about the field of new technologies using machine learning, decision making, uh, and, uh, and uh, preferences, how we work with this technology. For example, Sensitive Uses Committee thinks deeply about human rights and Microsoft's own commitment to human rights. And we work very diligently through cases that come through and generate principles from those cases. So for example, um, there'll be a, a case about Microsoft's consulting teams building systems using face recognition or prediction in policing applications for customers in country X. Is that okay? Is it okay to, to, for Microsoft to, to help customers sell a product like cigarettes? What about if the customer said, well, how about just identify who's gonna think about quitting and we'll take them down to less harmful heated or vaping products? long-term customer that might be enjoying our servers and email and O365 for several years. Or military decisions. If you want to see the outcome of some intensive ether deliberations, look at the blog that Microsoft posted yesterday about Microsoft and the Department of Defense. Also some New York Times stories that came out. This is again, this committee has been very active in that, in that area here. And if you look at the news and some of the press, we've said a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, and what I like about the, the current leadership of Microsoft is the comment has been, Ether Committee, take revenue off the table, make a recommendation. If you want to read about my Tesla accident and what I recommend about what we need to do about that, <laughs> search on my name and Wired <laughs> and Tesla. So I wanted to stop here now, but I think I would, as I say, continuing on, decision analysis the engineering uh, practice of action in the world provides clear systematic thinking about action. I think it's gonna be very important in pursuing foundational principles about intelligence, core intelligence, as well as intelligence that comes from computers working with people and, as systems. 
We need to attend with sensitivity to agency, values, and ethics in all the artifacts that we build. And we need to, we need to work carefully to enhance life and society with the, with, the, with the fruits of our efforts. And I say continuing on because I don't know what this retirement thing really means. <laughs> but uh, I intend to be tapping you and having conversations and, and seeking your advice on multiple fronts over the next decade or two. Thank, thanks very much for all your contributions, Ron.